Well, thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Gagne. I'm the Major of Support and Logistics here at Sanford Police Department. I'm just going to give you kind of a little uh, brief outline, and then I'll turn it over to Paul Auger. So this case came to our agency back in May uh, of 2017. It was during an excavation of Cumberland Farms in Sanford, which is right down the street, and, and we discovered some human remains. At that point for us, it was uh, a potential crime scene, like when we find any, any human remains. Uh, and then as we you know, kind of filtered down through some of the information, we realized that that was a site of, a, of an old graves uh, location. And then it was trying to figure out what the origin story of the person that was buried there. We then you know, were able to you know, have a lot of help from Paul Auger, which I'm going to turn this meeting over to uh, uh, next. And he'll kind of give you the story from when we left off uh, with that information, and then uh, Paul kind of took the reins from there. Thank you. Thank you, Major Gagne, and uh, his name is M A T T H E W and G A G N E with an accent on the E, if you want to spell it correctly. So. <laughs> My name is uh, Paul Auger. It looks like Auger, A-U-G-E-R. I'm a former police officer here at Sanford PD. Uh, I'm also a member of the Sanford Historical Committee. And I'm currently a teacher at Sanford High School in my 25th year of teaching social studies. And I was recently asked to become the official um, historian for the Sanford Police Department. So this is all kind of coming together pretty well. So our, our story, uh, the most recent part of it, starts in 2017. Uh, well, actually, we'll go back a little bit further. Uh, the first dedicated Sanford High School was built at the corner of Main and Emerson Street. And when it became overgrown, uh, there are too many students there. The, the school, by the way, was built right next to a burial ground. Because who's going to complain, right? And when they built the next new Sanford High School, which is now the Willard School on Main Street, the old Sanford High School became Emerson Grammar School. And having a grammar school, you would like to have a playground, but there is no place to have a playground because there's a graveyard next door. And then in 1903, uh, Thomas Goodall's son Ernest built a, and was part of a committee, he built a beautiful new cemetery featuring rolling hills and a bridge and a little waterfall uh, not very far from here. And it was much nicer than the old style burial ground. So people generally stopped being buried at the, the graveyard on Main Street, and they were all being buried at the new one called Oakdale Cemetery. And in the 1930s, it was decided that we really should, that the town should buy all those properties, get quick claim deeds, uh, all those graves, and have them moved to the new beautiful Oakdale Cemetery. And according to the Sanford Tribune, they did move everyone. Uh, there were, I want to say, at least 50 bodies that were moved, maybe 70. And they had a list of the bodies that were moved. That is something that we worked on, uh, one of our first hints. So Emerson School ends up uh, becoming the oldest elementary school in use in the state of Maine. It was literally built, I believe, 1901 it was dedicated. And it was very high on the state's list to replace. So Cumberland Farms, which was across the street, bought the entire area. They tore down the old Emerson School building and they were also going to, uh, that went along with that, the playground next door. And we had had an incident here in Sanford, I believe it was 1980, when the elevator shaft at the town hall annex connecting the annex with 
the town hall was being dug, they did find a human leg bone in there. And the state police came, it was quite exciting, until they discovered that that, that was actually a, an old cemetery too that they had been digging in. So <laughs> having seen this happen before, when the, when the foreman was on scene one day, I went to him and told him that, and I pointed out in this particular area, there was an old cemetery here, and it would be great when you're excavating, if maybe you could just keep an eye out as you're removing dirt, because you might find somebody they missed. They weren't supposed to miss anybody, but you know, it's happened before. And I have to give the foreman credit, that's exactly what he did. So one day they were excavating in what's now the rear of the building, and he caught a glimpse of something shiny and what looked like a human bone. So he stopped what he was doing, he called the police department, and that's when Sanford PD got involved. And I happened to be driving by, I don't know, 30 minutes later, by coincidence, and I saw a giant circle of police and firefighters and construction people looking down at something, and I immediately knew what had happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I worked with our, our wonderful police department and our city manager, Steve Buck, who deserves a lot of credit. And it was determined, we, we, you know, we called the medical examiner's office, and it was kind of unusual. They weren't really interested in this case as a priority because it's an unknown person, but it's a known burial in a known burial place. So it's not really a priority for them to do this. And I was, my fear was that this person would just be reburied anonymously and we may never know who it was or have any trace of them. So uh, I've done extensive genealogy as uh, Many, many of you have probably as a hobby, but I'd never worked on, with a DNA case before, so I had a big learning curve. Um, Major Gagne helped me a lot, and we ended up, uh, I uploaded the, the DNA that we had done by a company to uh, GEDmatch. Yeah, GEDmatch. Uh, G-E-D-M-A-T-C-H, and you've probably heard of the site. It's where a lot of law enforcement agencies have found success in cold cases. And I was able to find some distant relatives, but this person's death was so far back in time for me that I just couldn't, felt like I wasn't getting close. I was treading water. So we did some more research, and that's when I discovered the DNA Doe Project. And my goodness, it was tailor-made for what our situation was, except I thought the case might be too old. So we approached um, Jennifer's group to ask if they would take the case on, and I was, I was uh, flabbergasted when they said, yes, we would. And the director of case management, Jennifer Randolph, said that she was going to make herself the case director. Well, my goodness. Uh, so that's where that part of the story goes. And um, I want to answer a, a few other questions earlier on here. Um, it did take a long time. Uh, one reason was this is technology that I was not familiar with, and some of it was brand new technology. And one of the attempts we made at uh, pulling DNA from the remains did not work. And the second attempt did work, but that attempt, we had to wait quite a while because it went to a lab, uh, Marshall University, that typically just does homicide cases. And we waited quite a while, and I got this wonderful email from them saying, we can take your case now, right out of the blue. And I was really excited. So uh, we went through Marshall and another place, and, uh, and then there was a giant, we had meetings on Zoom with the DNA Doe people. They're extremely organized. And through a lot of uh, just talented people working on the case, we have the solution. We know who the person is. 
And actually, I'm going to let Jennifer Randolph uh, mostly take over here, because without her group, I'm not sure if we ever would have found out who it was. Thank you, Paul. And you're helping you want to spell, spell your name? I too. will, and yeah. you're going to help me with AV. So. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Randolph, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R. Randolph is R-A-N-D-O-L-P-H. Um, I would like to just start off by saying that we at the DNA Doe Project are so appreciative that the city of Sanford, is Sanford Police Department and Paul uh, entrusted us with this case um, and also invited us to be with you here today. I'd like to just briefly introduce our organization to you, uh, who we are and what we do, just to give you a bit of context. Then I would like to describe how it is that we were able to identify Woodlawn Cemetery Jane Doe. And then lastly, I'd like to share a bit of this Doe's story with you. I want to bring her to life for you all in the same way that re researching her brought her to life for us. So the DNA Doe Project. We're a nonprofit organization with a simple humanitarian mission to return names and identities to the tens of thousands of does throughout the United States and Canada. We do this, as Paul mentioned, by using investigative genetic genealogy. This is a relatively new technique that combines the power of DNA with genealogical research. We have over 75 dedicated genetic genealogist volunteers who work for us, and they donate their time and talent to our cases. To date, we have returned names to almost 100 does. Our investigative genetic genealogy services are provided to our partners who are more typically law enforcement agencies, medical examiners, or coroners uh, pro bono. We want every doe to have a chance to be identified, and we don't want cost to be a barrier to that opportunity. Well, this case is a bit different than our typical cases because we do know that at one time, uh, Woodlawn Jane Doe did have her name. Uh, it's also true that as of 2017, her identity was essentially disappeared. We didn't know who she is. And since we as an, organi since we as an organization believe that every individual deserves the dignity of being remembered by their name in honor of the value of their life, we were happy to assist the city of Sanford to solve their mystery. We can now tell you, Woodlawn Jane Doe is in fact Miss Edith Patton. We know she was born about April 1867, likely in Somerset, Maine. We know she lived there when she was three years old because of the 1870 census. She's the daughter of Ferdinand Weston Patton and Lois Stinchfield. She, she died November 12, 1891, here in Sanford from consumption, which is most likely tuberculosis. So how did we find her? I'd like to explain a little bit about the DNA piece. Thank you, Paul. Yes. We began our genealogical research in mid-May of 2022 with the upload of this DOE's profile into a database that we are allowed to use for this kind of work, and that is GEDmatch Pro. Pro, GEDmatch Pro is the side that law enforcement can use. Uh, GEDmatch is what consumers use. So a lot of people who test with direct-to-consumer companies like Ancestry or 23andMe can download their raw data if they so choose and upload it to this database. So it's a way that genealogy enthusiasts can compare themselves to other DNA testers regardless of where they test it. And uh, relatively recently, uh, this database allows law enforcement cases to upload as well, and that includes, uh, as is the situation here, unidentified remains. So we uploaded um, the profile, and as Paul said, I took the luxury of assigning myself to this case because it's local to me, and I was just so taken with Paul's story and everything this community has put in to try and identify her, I really felt like I wanted to be a part of it. Um, we had a very small team. It was myself, uh, my colleague Kevin Lord, and then a former Maine resident, she's relatively recently moved away, Stacy Simmons. So the three of us were working on this case together. We were very fortunate, as you can see on this diagram, we had some relatively what we would call high matches. 
So when you upload to the database, the profile's compared to other people, and you get a list back of these sort of DNA relative matches, people who share common DNA with our dough. How much DNA they share clues us into how closely related they are. So we have a couple matches up there. You'll see in the 200-ish centimorgans, that's sort of the unit of measurement we work in, um, range. And those are what we would kind of say roughly second cousin. And that's a very good size match. That's the sweet spot for being able to figure out these cases. Now, however, we had to take into account that present day testers are many generations farther ahead than this individual who we know had to have passed away during the time this cemetery was uh, in, in, in use. That actually helped us because there might be, for example, 10 relationships consistent with two people sharing those amounts of DNA. But knowing that she was several generations farther back in time, we could automatically start ruling out some of those potential relationships. For example, living people today are not going to be second cousins of someone who died in the late Victorian era. So that really helped us kind of focus our research. We could look at what relationships share this amount of DNA and are consistent with the time frame. We started building back family trees of these highest matches to sort of find where they would converge. And we pretty quickly honed in on this gentleman, Ferdinand Weston Hatton, who you can see there in the diagram. He had married three times, and he had children with two of his wives, his first wife and his third wife. Our doe shared an amount of DNA with descendants of the children he had with his third wife that was consistent with her being their half great great aunt. So they're half siblings, right? They had the same father, but different mother. So then descendants are also in a half relationship. So now we kind of had a place to look. The DNA was consistent with those relationships. Now we want to look at the children he had with that first wife and see if any of them might be unaccounted for or could be the person who was here in Stanford. So that's where we really focused. Um, it became apparent to us as we did this, and we carefully studied the children he had in his first marriage, that um, after just a few weeks, we felt that Edith Patton was our likely doe. Um, continued work, uh, as you'll see in the diagram, we were also able to find a DNA relative match who was related to um, Edith through her maternal side. So we have accounted for both her maternal and paternal sides with matches in this DNA database. So that's uh, fairly identified, fairly identifying, excuse me. So we felt pretty confident uh, we knew who she was. The DNA was telling us this is who it is, but we were a little flummoxed as to how she could have possibly landed in Sanford. We were seeing evidence of her family in Somerset County, Auburn, Maine, and Lewiston, Maine, but we really weren't coming up with any direct ties to Sanford. So we wanted to uh, delve into that a little bit more and take the time to do some more research. Can you put up Ferdinand or the Taiwan? Um, let's start with a family diagram. And if I point to the diagram and walk away from the mics, is that bad? Yes, okay. <laughs> I have one here. Oh, yeah, okay. somewhere. Um, so you look at this diagram, you'll see Ferdinand in blue. So this is the father of Edith. And you'll see his three wives, one in yellow, one in green and one in purple. So the first wife is Lois Stinchfield in the green circle. And you'll see that with Lois, he had three children, our candidate, Edith Patton, and then another daughter, Alfreda Frances Patton, she often went by Frances, and then a son, Lendell Patton. So they had three children. Uh, their relationship um, faltered and Ferdinand filed for, for divorce uh, from Lois um, alleging abandonment and adultery. So this was a fractured family. Um, the divorce was eventually granted um, and he married his wife in the purple circle uh, soon after that, that's Emma. Um, they never had any children though. Emma died just three years after that marriage without any children. It's, it's possible she may have died in childbirth. Uh, and Ferdinand went on to marry his third and last wife right there in yellow where Paul's pointing Agnes Avery. Now they had four children, and those children's children, you know, they had children and so on. And it's actually descendants of those children in yellow that matched to 
Edith in the database. So they were really the key to us figuring this out. I want to um, just go over the timeline maybe a little bit. I think this really helps us to understand Edith's life um, and make her a little bit more real to us and also help us understand why it is that she was so hard to find. Thank you, Paul, for putting that up. So this is a timeline of really her family and what happened. Her parents, Ferdinand and Lois, married in 1866. And then Edith, we know, was born about 1867. A little while later in 1870, we know from the census that her sister, Alfreda Francis, was born. And then in 1872, uh, her brother, Lendell, was born. By 1880, the family's in trouble. At just 13 years old, we see Edith is working as a live-in housekeeper for another family. She's working full time. Her father's trying to get a divorce, it's dragging on, and his wife ends up not appearing, so he is granted the divorce by default. He's given custody of his two daughters, while the young son, uh, custody of him, is given to Lois. Just days after the divorce is granted, uh, the father, Ferdinand, remarries his second wife within about a week. Three years after that, as I mentioned, that second wife is passing away, and in 1884, the following year, he's marrying that third wife, Agnes Avery. Um, in 1885, uh, he starts having children with his third wife. So these would be half-siblings to Edith. He has Arthur, who was born in Lewiston, Maine. In 1888, another half-brother named Ernest is born in Lewiston. And then in uh, 1899, going back to the first wife, so this would be uh, Edith's mother, Lois and her brother Lendell, we find them living together in Lewiston, Maine, so they have stayed together in Lewiston. Lendell is a shoemaker at this point. But in 1890, uh, Lendell dies in Auburn, Maine. Edith, and we'll get into how we know this in a second, dies here in Sanford in 1891. And this will be hard for you to see, but I'm going to read it to you um, in a moment. So we see um, in 1899, uh, Edith's father has his first daughter by his third wife and names her Edith. Again, it's probably homage to his dead daughter and support, supporting the fact that we have the right Edith, um, naming his, his, own, his uh, only daughter with his third wife after his deceased daughter. By 1900, Edith's mother, Lois, um, and this was actually key for us, and the, um, the 1900 census asked a very interesting question of women. It asked them, how many children have you had? And of those children, how many are still living? This was really a vital clue to our investigation. In that census, uh, she reported, so this is Edith's mom, that she had borne three children in her lifetime, which we knew from the divorce uh, documentation, the court records but that only one survived. We knew from looking around that Frances, that middle daughter, was still alive. And we knew that Lendell, the brother, had died. So by process of elimination, we know that by 1900, Edith is also deceased. So this is all um, supporting what the DNA was telling us, that it's Edith Patton, and she had, was deceased by 1900. Uh, in 1901, Mother Lois herself dies in Auburn. And then Father, Ferdinand Patton, he ends up dying in Augusta with dementia in 1909. And that sister who had been the one surviving child, uh, she dies in Boston in 1917. We still wanted some more concrete proof that Edith, the DNA is pointing to Edith, we know she's deceased by 1900, but we wanted to really get her here in Sanford. Unfortunately, there aren't great uh, death records for the appropriate time period in Sanford. And the 1890 census, which would have been very helpful if perhaps she was already here, uh, would have told us what she was doing here and where she lived, um, that was destroyed in a fire. I believe it was back in the 20s, 1920s. So we don't have that resource. So that leaves a big gap we had to figure out. Um, we were very fortunate 
there were some documents of um, some citizens of uh, Sanford who had kind of kept diaries of events, um, and those had been transcribed by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, really just kind of a calendar, you know, so-and-so was born, so-and-so was born today to this couple, et cetera, et cetera. And leaping through that one day, um, I stumbled across an entry where he said that Edith Patton died today. So then we had a date, and we had an Edith Patton dying in Sanford at the right period of time. And this gave us what we needed to search in newspapers. And this is what you see here. We were able to locate um, mention of her death in a newspaper, and let me just find that for you. This is from the Biddeford Daily Journal, dated November 25th, 1891. Miss Edith Patton died of consumption last Thursday, aged 24 years and seven months. She was beloved by a large circle of friends who sincerely mourn her untimely death. Notice that there's no mention of any family there. She's not described as being the daughter of anyone, um, just that she had a large circle of friends. Again, um, an indication that she was in Sanford likely without any family with her. Um, it's possible she came here to work at, at one of the mills, I think. Um, her father worked in a sawmill and then textile mills historically, so that would have been an occupation she was familiar with. Um, the conditions working in different mills um, are conducive to the spread of tuberculosis, but that is all just speculation. Uh, we really don't know. We really don't know for sure. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of her life. She, she clearly was a hard worker, working from a very young age. She came from a fractured family. Um, divorce wasn't that common then, and this was clearly not a friendly divorce given the allegations that were thrown out uh, between the spouses. But we know she's a good friend. Um, sounds like she was social and, uh, as it says, beloved by a, a, a large circle of people. So our Woodlawn Cemetery, Jane Doe, has gone from essentially being invisible, and I say that because she was in so few records, and if you looked online at family trees that people put up um, for the public that you can see, you would often see trees that would have her parents, her brother and her sister, but she was never there. There was just so little connecting her to this family. You know, she was in one census document where she was with that family as, as a three-year-old. And, you know, of the commonly uh, accessed documents, that was really it. Unless you were diving into court records and found that divorce uh, uh, documentation, you really wouldn't have known any much about her. So she was rather invisible, and I think that's probably part of the reason why uh, no one was looking out for her when these burials were removed. We don't even know if she ever had a marker. You know, would, would her friends have been able to buy that for her? Perhaps not. So she was invisible then, um, and would, you know, as thinking back to our mission, it's so important that people's lives are recognized, their stories are known, and they matter. And here we are, some 130 years after her death, um, and Edith, who's been invisible and unidentified here since 2017, is now going to be featured in press all over the place and in the history of Sanford. Uh, and I think that that's a pretty happy ending for Edith. And it's also um, a great tribute to how caring the people of Sanford are. Thank you. And before we go to questions, I'd like to uh, thank a few other people and get to one other point. Uh, a very important person in this entire thing was city manager Stephen Buck. I, I don't think we could have done this without his assistance and dealing with the district attorney's office and the uh, medical examiner. Pete Smith from the highway department uh, both of them came to the scene and and wanted to help and we we needed a sifter to go through materials because none of us had ever done this before and Richard Cody at Shaw's Hardware made one for us on the spot right in his store and that's what we used to recover 
uh, many of the parts of the coffin and some of the remains. Uh, we had people uh, loan us a tent. Uh, I also need to thank my son Andrew who was uh, back in junior high school and got a day off from school to exhume a body. That was very exciting for him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just people that were offering uh, great suggestions. The mayor at the time was Tom Cody and he had it put on the city council agenda to appropriate money to make this project happen. And we need to thank the city council, uh, Mayor Cody, and our current mayor, uh, Becky Brink. And I can't say enough uh, nice things about Stephen for really helping us, our city manager. So one of the big questions now is what happens to Edith? So the, the city council's charge uh, to me was to try to identify who this person was. So we've done that. And now the question is where should she go? And uh, I think we're gonna leave that up to this, the city manager and the city council, not to pass the buck, but I think it's too big a decision for, for just one person to make. And one possibility is to put her where she should have been moved, Oakdale Cemetery. Um, and after she had passed away, her family moved to Augusta and her entire family is buried in the same cemetery right near each other in Augusta except for her. So another possibility might be to have her interred in Augusta with the rest of the family. But we'll, we'll leave that up to the, the council and our city manager. And I think I'm, I'm happy to take questions myself, Major Gagne or uh, Jennifer, if anybody has any. Curious, Paul, just given your affinity for local history, are you going to now dive into all the photographs and all of Harlan's books and see if she pops up anywhere? Uh, so the question is, uh, me being uh, really into our local history, am I going to try to find some photographs of her? Um, I hadn't really thought of that. There is a fairly good chance that we have a picture of her somewhere. Um, I'm not sure how we could ever identify her, but it's certainly worth looking into. And, and who knows, we may stumble across her name somewhere else. I was, this was one of the most amazing discoveries to me. And this is, we have to thank MacArthur Library for putting this online. And that was a, a huge help. So I'm, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think it would have, you want to? Possibly, yes, I, I um, think unlikely. I mean, she was referred to um, as Miss, but. Um, oh, sorry, the, so the question was, is it possible Edith uh, could have had a child? Are you thinking in that the child, the yeah. remains belong to the child? So that would change the expected amount of shared DNA because it would be one generation uh, different, uh, actually closer to, you know, to the people who tested. So it would sort of, sort of change that calculus of what kind of relationships are consistent with the DNA. So I don't think that that is likely. I think we're, we're fairly convinced that this is really um, the only kind of relationship that would fit. So I, I don't think it, it would have been a child. Yes. Just clarify what um, journal that was from in 1891, was it? It's, um, sorry. Oh, it's okay. So uh, there's a question about what exact uh, news source this was. That is taken from the Biddeford Daily Journal, uh, and it was uh, the November 25th, 1891 um, edition. And they did, as many newspapers did in sort of the heavier urban areas, uh, they did cover Sanford News and this is the predecessor to the Journal Tribune, and it's the same, same company. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying. Any other questions? Paul, you've been working at this for nearly six years. Could you give us an idea of just how 
how many estimated hours you personally invested? Oh boy. <laughs> um, so question is, how, how many hours have I spent on this? Um, first, I tell you that I don't count, and I kind of don't care. <laughs> it's, uh, it's something to me that's so important and creates such a drive in me to, f to do justice for this person that, you know, I don't know if, if it was 50 or 75 hours, that wouldn't surprise me at all. It, c it could be more. And uh, our DNA folks, if you collectively added up their hours, I'm sure that would be quite a bit too. But it, there were a lot of hours uh, learning what centimorgans were for me <laughs> and uh, trying to get to speed on, on DNA and relationships like that and going back to science sort of. But it, I, I enjoyed every minute of it and I'm so happy it came to fruition here. So we, you know, that we've identified this woman. Any other questions? Okay, I'll, um, I'll hang around. I'm going to be free here. And uh, I think the major can stick around and Jen. And we've got um, some better copies or different copies of the posters that don't have as much glare. And uh, thank you for coming and thank you for uh, being interested in Edith's story. I, I think she deserved this. Thank you.